going to talk about several things in this series. We're going to talk about the indwelling of the Spirit. How many know He's already in you if you're saved? Now then we're going to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And it's really strange to me that in an age and a day that the church needs more of the Holy Spirit than ever, we're talking about Him less and less. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is, is something that every one of us needs to walk in the life. In fact, 40 and a half years ago, 41 years ago in September, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So as we get into this, we're going to talk about the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And with the baptism with the Holy Spirit comes the ability to pray in a supernatural way. We're going to talk about that. And then we'll start, at, and then at the very end of this series, we're going to talk about how to hear the voice of God in life's details. How many know we need to hear Him every single day? Today we're going to talk about the indwelling of the Spirit, ten ways the Holy Spirit works in us. How many know that as we travel through life, we have the same issues and problems that other people have, we just happen to have a different set of answers? Is that good news? So let me backtrack here. If you don't have one of these sheets, raise your hand, and we'll make sure you get one. Everybody should have one. There you go. Just lift your hand. Ushers are ready for you. If you need a pen, raise your hand. We do the the fill-in-the-blank thing here. Got one up front here, guys, way up front. And if you need a pen, raise your hand. They've got both sheets and pens. Let me also say this before I get right into this again, that uh, on our app, uh, church app, Victory Church NC, uh, download it if you haven't yet. The exhaustive notes are on there, a lot more in there than I can usually ever share. So make sure you check that out. You can also fill out the little bubbles on the, uh, on the app as well, and you don't even need the paper. So that's really cool. Also, all of our ministry last year is on this uh, is on this uh, flash drive here, and it's available $20 in the bookstore. And then you can also give it to them, and they'll put all of this year's ministry, including notes. So what we want you to do is go give it all away. How's that? And minister life to someone else. Is that good? My encouragement, get the word in you. If you'll st- heck, hang around here for a year, two years, your life will never be the, cha- be the same. If you'll put into practice the things we share, how many know your life can be transformed in a powerful way? And if you'll do that, I promise you, we've had so many people come up to me and say, my life is not what it used to be. It's because the Word of God is alive. It's living. It gets inside of you. How many know it changes you if you let it? And it's the power of the Spirit of God that brings that to pass. So we have the same problems everybody else around us has. The good news is we have a different set of answers. And this is not in your notes or anything, but my mind always goes back to Exodus 33 and... uh, Moses came down from top of Mount Sinai after receiving the law and the sacrifice, the priesthood, all that. And the Israelites were in sin and God was ready to wipe them out. He prayed for them and said, don't. And then God said, well, I'm going to use you. He said, no, use everybody. And then God said, well, I withdraw my presence except from you. He said, no, please come. And then uh, then, uh, Moses said, how will everyone else know that you're with us if you don't go with us? And then God said, well, my presence will go with you. And that is the way you and, your, and you and my people will be separated from all the people on the face of the earth. What makes a difference in our lives? It's the presence of the Holy Spirit. We go through the same challenges. We have to work like everybody else, raise our children like everybody else. The difference is we have a helper. Is that good news? And then I'm also reminded of Acts 14. Uh, Peter and John, they were persecuted because uh, uh, a man was healed that had been a lifelong cripple and it upset the religious people. How many know the Holy Spirit often upsets religious people? It's regular. And they saw the boldness of Peter and John. They perceived that they hadn't been to college like everybody else. They were uneducated, common men. They were astonished. But they recognized they had been with Jesus because the presence was on them. And what separates us from everybody around us? The presence. Is that good news? So Jesus said this, John 14, if you love me, keep my commandments. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the spirit of truth whom the world can't receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him. And he said he dwells with you and will be in you. So the Holy Spirit was with the Old Testament saints. He was with the disciples as they walked with Jesus. The only problem is he couldn't get inside of them until they were saved. No Old Testament people, Abraham, Moses, David, all those guys, they didn't have the Holy Spirit in them. The Holy Spirit came upon them. Even the prophet of the Old Testament would prophesy, but the Holy Spirit came upon him. It wasn't living in him in the way he's living inside of you. That's a huge deal, and that's really different. So Jesus said, if you love me, keep my word, and I'll ask the Father, and he'll give you another helper. And we'll take another lesson and examine another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, 
whom the world can't receive because it neither sees nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you on the outside, side by side with the disciples, helping them, even enabling them to minister in some of the ways that Jesus ministered. But he says, and will be in you. Speaking of the day we're living in today, I will not leave you as orphans. I won't abandon you. See, he knew what they would think when he went to the cross and died. He thought, well, the person that solved all our problems is gone. He paid our taxes for us. If somebody was sick, he healed them. If we had a problem, you know, casting a demon out of somebody, well, he would go and help them. He sat and he taught the people everything we needed was all wrapped up in Jesus and Jesus said to him look I'm not leaving you as orphans because he knew the thought would come to them you've left us by ourselves to deal with this great big world in the Roman Empire and what are we going to do he said he said I will not leave you orphans I will come to you so in the person of the Holy Spirit now it's possible for every one of us to experience Jesus the way the disciples did is that not awesome Now, all my life, I've heard people say, well, if we just lived in the first century and if we just could have walked with Jesus, you know, and and been with him in those years of ministry, wouldn't that be something? The truth is you've got it better than they had it. Is that good news? So don't don't be thinking, well, I wish. No, no, you're living in the grandest day because the Holy Spirit's here. He's available to help us in every sphere of living if we'll just let him. How many want to let him? So we're, we're in that age of great change right now. There's change, there's challenge, there's danger. And see, God hasn't left us alone to deal with these serious problems that are coming. You know, last night, London, you know, was attacked again by terrorists. And this terrorist thing, uh, it looks like it's going to grow. And uh, hopefully it won't become a worldwide event. Scripture is really clear, however, that the Middle East will be eaten up with chaos and calamity. But uh, it could come on our shores. How many know we need to pray about all these things? But see, even in all this, the Holy Spirit's your helper. He'll let you know when you need to be where you be, need to be, when you need to be there. And if there's danger lurking somewhere around you, how many know he can let you know that? And then he can have you pray for your family, pray for your uh, immediate family, your extended family, pray for your children. And how many know God can make a way for you? The Holy Spirit is the omnipresence of God. We just finished the series, I Am, where you looked at 16 characteristics of God's nature. And uh, one of them is that he's omnipresent. That is, he's everywhere at all time. And that's the Holy Spirit's role. There is no place in the universe that the Holy Spirit is not. Is that not cool? A lot of people think, well, the Holy Spirit is a restrainer in 2 Thessalonians 2. And uh, the Antichrist can't be revealed until the restrainer is removed. A lot of people through the years say, well, the restrainer is the Holy Spirit. That's impossible. He could never be removed from the earth. Is that good? In fact, this is a real shocker. Even people that don't know the Lord will, will, will somehow know that the Holy Spirit is near. Because listen to this in eternity. Psalm 139. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, you're there. Wow. Can you imagine being in the flames of hell? And there's the Holy Spirit. You could have had me. You could have loved me. You could have let me. But you chose not to. He's there. Can you believe even those that go to hell will recognize that God exists, that God is real, and that he is everywhere? Wow, isn't that that a thought? He said, if I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, the farthest part of the ocean depths, sometimes 20 miles deep, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Now, what does that say to us? There's no place in life where the Holy Spirit isn't. Is that good news? Do you have days that you feel like God is not near? Do you ever feel like God has forsaken you? ever feel like in your circumstance, you know, there's no help, there's no aid. It's like I'm by myself. That is never true. That's only feelings and it's never fact because the Holy Spirit's always with you. Is that good news? It's great. So we're going to talk about the indwelling of the Spirit, 10 things He wants to do inside of us today. There are two major works of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. Now, I was raised in a denomination or church that did not teach this, and they looked down their nose at people that do. So here's what I want to encourage you to do. Take your Bible out, have the spirit of the Bereans in the book of Acts. They search the Scriptures to see whether these things be so. Because in the ensuing weeks, if you'll just come back, and if you're watching online, keep watching because we want to talk about the role of the Holy Spirit in our life, and we're going to talk about two roles of the Holy Spirit. First of all, there's the indwelling of the Spirit. Everybody say the indwelling. 
how many are glad that you have somebody living inside of you? It's a really phenomenal thought to think as a human being that a personality, an eternal personality lives inside of you. Wow. If you think about that just a little bit, it'll change how you think. It'll change how you talk. It'll change what you do. It'll change how you talk to your spouse. To, how many hear me? It's a big deal, isn't it? We take these things for granted, particularly if we've been, we've been in the Lord for a long time, but we don't need to. So the indwelling of the Spirit comes at the moment of the new birth. How many know the indwelling is for one thing? It changes our character. It brings the character of Jesus. We'll see that in just a minute. And then the baptism with the Holy Spirit. That is the power of God, and the baptism with the Holy Spirit is for power. So if you think of the indwelling for character... And then the baptism with the Holy Spirit is for the power of God. You can have character without power. But how many know you better not have power without character? How many hear that? So we'll get into some of that. And this is really interesting to me. We're going to look at the indwelling of the Spirit today. And and, uh, there's an analogy so clearly seen by what Jesus did on the day that he was raised from the dead. You know, back in Genesis chapter 2 when God first created Adam, the sixth day of creation, he scooped his body from the dust and and actually um, made the corporeal substance of of Adam's body from dirt. And that's why all of our stuff we eat comes from the dirt because, you know, we're carbon-based creatures. And then it says, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into, breathed the breath of life into man's nostrils. So literally bent down over the, the body he created and, and put something of himself into man. It says, and man became a living being. So God put a spirit nature inside of Adam. You don't hear about the spirit nature outside of the church today because psychologists and those who think they know everything don't recognize the spiritual nature of man. But we are spiritual beings and God made us in his image and likeness. But it's really unusual on the day that Jesus was raised from the dead, resurrection day. Here it is and I'm just going to read it. You can't make it clearer than the scriptures. John 20, 19, then the same day at evening being the first day of the week. When the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came, stood in the midst, and said, Peace be with you. When he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father sent me, I send you. And when he said this, watch this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Now, isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? Uh, Whoever, if you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they're retained. He put them in the ministry of ministering life to others. But it's really uncanny to me that on the day that he was raised from the dead, came to his disciples that evening and breathed on them the same way God breathed on Adam. Now, Now, what was he saying? God gave Adam natural life. But I'm now giving you back your spiritual life because I went to the cross, went to hell, was raised from the dead. Your sin debt has been legally paid. I'm going to the right hand of the Father where I will sit. Mary saw him that morning and Jesus said, don't touch me yet because I'm not yet ascended to my Father. So in between the time that Jesus was raised from the dead and this experience here at that evening, Jesus went up before the throne of God and presented himself as the sacrifice for sin. Woo! And that also presented his blood in the heavenly holy of holies, as Hebrews talks about. And then he came to the disciples and now you can come alive. Now you can have life again. Now you can have what God wanted you to have when he created you. Now you can be alive and not one third dead. Isn't that awesome? My opinion is that's when the church was born. Jesus breathed on them. The Holy Spirit came into them. They were born again that day, 10 days later, uh, uh, after his, uh, uh, 10 days after he ascended. He spent 40 days talking to him. Then 10 days after he ascended, the power of God came on Pentecost Sunday. They were baptized with the Holy Spirit, with the power of God. Two separate experiences. We'll talk about that more clear, even more clearly later. So when the Holy Spirit comes, there's at least 10 things that he'll work in you. How many know that? So fill in the blanks here. The Holy Spirit creates, everybody say Unity. Fill in the blank in the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, 1 Corinthians 12. Some are Gentiles, some are slaves, some are free. 
Uh, but all have been baptized into one body by one spirit, and we all share the sh- same spirit. So because you're born again, it creates unity, and, and we are, are baptized or placed into the body of Christ. There's several baptisms of the believer. One is baptism in water. You're placed into water. Another is the baptism with the Holy Spirit where you're immersed in Holy Spirit. And then there's the baptism, listen to this, into the body of Christ where you're immersed into a great big family. You may have been raised in a, in a foster home. You may not have a family, but once you get born again, you're surrounded by a great big family. God has incorporated you into the family of God, and that creates the ability to have unity in the family of God. How many hear that? There's a kindredness, I want to say it this way, that you feel uh, towards believers. If you've done any traveling and ministered anywhere, I've ministered, you know, like I said, a number of nations, and particularly Africa, India, and uh, a few other places. But nonetheless, uh, when you go to these other cultures, one thing that, that I noticed the first time we went overseas was... Uh, uh, the kindredness on the inside with people I had never met, met I didn't know but there was something inside of me that bore witness to something that was inside of them how many know that's the Holy Spirit and here let me tell you what the enemy's busy at today he's busy at creating division and disunity among believers so that the Holy Spirit can't do anything how many hear what I just said So the biggest thing that I can do and you can do is whether you like, agree, disagree with your fellow believer, love them. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Don't forget that just because a person's not like you doesn't mean God doesn't love them just like he loves you. And don't forget that when you think another person's struggling, just remember that the ground is level at the foot of the cross But for a person to live like you're living, some people have to try a whole lot harder. You might might have started here in life. Some people start way down here because they don't have the family foundation that you had. And they struggle and they sweat just to try to to be normal. And that's why we need to give each other a lot of space and grace. And that's why we need to make allowances for one another. Like Ephesians 4, 2 says, because of our love. How many hear that? So I got a question for you. Do you promote unity in the body of Christ? The Holy Spirit does. So are you working with him or are you hindering him? There is a spirit that produces slander in America today. How many hear what I just said? It's working in the political world. It's working in the world outside the church. And it's trying to creep into church. And, uh, you know, now everybody's got to say. Everybody wants to say what they think. Sometimes you need to keep your mouth shut. If your mind is not in line with the Word of God. How many hear that? The Holy Spirit, if you yield to Him, even if you see something you don't like, often He has you pray and keep your mouth shut. How many hear that? Well, that was all free. Anyway, that's number one. Number two, the Holy Spirit gives us the desire. Everybody say desire. To be like Jesus. Romans, I love Romans 8 9. This is New King James. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed... The Spirit of God dwells in you. I love the way the Holy Spirit had the Apostle Paul uh, speak here, this next sentence. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, everybody say the Spirit of Christ. He's not his. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. Jesus said the Holy Spirit will take what's mine and he'll show it to you. So everything Jesus was, As he walked three and a half years with the disciples, the Holy Spirit is to you. Is that good? So he is the nature of Jesus. What does that mean? How do you make that practical? He will enable you and lead you to act in every situation the way Jesus would act. How did Jesus act when he found someone in sin? Would he beat him over the head and never talk to him again? No, he offered him a way out, a way of escape. He didn't condemn. He ministered life. How many know we're supposed to minister life? How many hear me? How would Jesus treat his mama and his daddy? How would Jesus treat his siblings? How would Jesus work? Would he work hard or would he be a slackard? Would he go sit down when the boss is not looking? No, everything Jesus was, the Holy Spirit is in me. Uh, Would Jesus have a smile on his face when he meets somebody new or would he look away? 
If somebody did him wrong, would Jesus go around the other aisle in the, in the grocery store so he can't, he don't have to talk to them? No, 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 no. Jesus go say, hey, how you doing? He came up to Peter. <laughs> Peter had sinned. He said, Peter, Peter. He said, he said, he said to the people that saw him when he was racing the day, go sell, tell my disciples and Peter. He pointed Peter. The other ones, I, I imagine the other ones saying, why didn't he call my name? Why didn't he call my name? I didn't mess up the way Peter did. Why did he call Peter's name? Because he's, he's after you. Because he loves you. You can't mess up enough to keep him from loving you. Is that good news? <laughs> the Holy Spirit gives us a desire to be like Jesus. Watch this, Galatians 2.20. You've got to move quickly. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. You know, we sing those songs, Jesus is alive in me. How is he alive in me? Well, he's alive in us because the Holy Spirit's in us. And his job is to make us think, act, speak, and respond like Jesus. Is that true? So he said, Christ lives in me. The life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. James, the practical half-brother of Jesus, said, so get rid of all the filth in your lives and evil in your lives. Humbly accept the word God's planted in your hearts. It has the power to save your souls. He said, once you're saved, you've got all this residue of mess in your mind, your emotions, in your body. And, and, but he says, you know, get rid of that stuff. Put yourself aloof from it. Say, I don't want it. And then humbly accept the word because the word will drive out all of those desires, that sin placed in your mind, in your emotions, in your body. And let the spirit of God inside of you, the spirit of Jesus, rise up. And how many know the more of the word that dwells in you, the more potentially that the spirit of God can control you. Is it true? How many know Jesus is the living word? Then number three, the Holy Spirit produces in us a sense of, of being right, fill in the blank, with God. Titus 3, 5. He saves us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins. Is that good news? He's giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. Now, now watch this. So there's some theological terms. We know what salvation is. Salvation encompasses all that Jesus did for us in his death, burial, and resurrection. But there's another word we rarely talk about. It's regeneration. How many know I was dead one day? You were dead to God. You had no desire for God. Don't forget, see, sometimes we don't think thoroughly in, 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 in these things enough to really see what's going on around us. You're going to work. You're mostly working with people that are dead. Why do you expect them to act like you? Why do you expect them to be nice? Why do you expect them to be kind and truthful? They're dead. That sounds really rough, doesn't it? That sounds really rough. Most of the people you meet are dead, spiritually dead spiritually separated from God. That's why you stick out like a healed thumb. Right? Because you're alive. Huh? And so regeneration is where the Holy Spirit comes in and he takes that part of us, our spirit nature, that was dead to sin and produced spiritual death and all of its ilk. And he literally removes it from our human spirit. Is that good news? And he makes us right with God. And so you have the sense on the inside that you've been made the righteousness of God in him. And I've mentioned this on Wednesday nights. Righteousness is the ability to stand before God just as though you had never done wrong. Just as though sin and inferiority had never been a part of your life. Everybody's quiet. Really? Yeah. Yeah. How many know when you know that you're righteous in God's sight because the blood of Jesus made you that way, you can stand before God just as though you never did anything wrong? Do you think that way? If you don't, get the mind renewed. If you're a Christian, get your mind renewed. If you don't know the Lord, you can be saved from your sin. If your past has, has, has followed you into the room today or your past is sitting with you where you're watching on Facebook, guess what? When you come to Jesus, your past gets removed. And you become righteous. If you're a believer, say it out loud. I'm righteous. What does that mean? You stand before God just as though you had no past. Just like a newborn baby. That's how God sees you. 
Does that give you boldness? Yes, it does. Does your mind accept that? Totally no, no. You got to get it renewed because it'll tell you you're not right and never will be. That's when you have to say, no, God said I'm right with him. Shut up. How many, how many have to tell your mind, shut up a lot? Yeah. Number four, the Holy Spirit seeks to keep us, everybody say pure. Mm. First Corinthians six nineteen and 20. Don't you realize your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself for God brought you with a high price. You must honor God with your body. So how many know the Holy Spirit has something to say with what we do with our physical bodies? How many believe the Holy Spirit wants us to be pure? That means pure in thought, pure with what we do with our bodies, pure with what we think, pure with how we respond, pure with our words. He wants to keep us pure. I came across J.B. Phillips' translation of 1 Thessalonians 3 many years ago, and it just blessed me. Let me read this. It's so clear. God's plan is to make you holy. This is 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 through 8. J.B. Phillips translated the Bible in 1958, the year I was born. Excellent translation. God's plan is to make you holy. And that entails, first of all, a clean cut with sexual immorality. Each one of you should learn to control his body, keeping it pure, treating it with respect. Isn't that great? And never regarding it as an instrument for self-gratification, as do pagans with no knowledge of God. He said you can't break this rule without in some way cheating your fellow men. And you must remember that God will punish all who offend in this matter. And we have warned you how we have seen this work out in our experience of life. The calling of God is not to impurity, but to the most thorough purity. And anyone who makes light of the matter is not making light of man's ruling, but of God's command. It's not for nothing the Spirit God gives us is called the Holy Spirit. Is that good? He's the Holy Spirit. One of the major job he is, he, jobs he has is to make you pure and holy. How many know when you're reading something you shouldn't read, he's going to stand up inside and say, stop. How many know if you're looking at something you shouldn't look at, he's going to say, stop. How many know if you're dressing in a way that's inappropriate that attracts the opposite sex to lust, the Holy Spirit's going to deal with you? Unless you've, you've dumbed your conscience down to where you can't hear his voice. Sad to say a lot of believers have today. How many hear me? Number five, the Holy Spirit will lead us away from the harmful effects of our culture. So fill in the blanks there. Second Corinthians 6, don't team up with those who were unbelievers. How can righteousness be apart with wickedness? Cause the believer righteousness. Can you believe that? Wow, cause the unbeliever wickedness. How can light live with darkness? Cause the believer light, cause the unbeliever darkness. What harmony can there be between Christ? Cause the believer Christ and the devil. Cause the unbeliever the devil. Why? Because you're in league with him. Then he says, how can a believer be apart with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple? Cause the believer God's temple and idols. Calls a person who doesn't know the Lord an idol because they're living only to please themselves. For we are the temple of the living God, as God has said. I will live in them and walk in them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among unbelievers. That is, in the way they live and what they do and, and what they espouse is, is, is okay. And separate yourselves from them. Not in your workplace, but in your heart, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things. And I will welcome you. How many want to be welcomed by God? He says, I'll be your father. You'll be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. How many know that in all we do, we're to bring attention to Jesus? Yes or no? So, so does how I dress bring attention to Jesus? Or does it bring attention to me? That's a big question today. People are doing all kinds of things with their bodies today. You know why? They want to be something. They want somebody to notice them. They want to be different. Well, you know what? It ain't, life is no longer, when you make Jesus Lord, about us and me and how I feel. Life is about Jesus and who he is and letting other people see him through me. Yes or no? So the next time you go to alter your body, go ask Jesus about that. I used a very generic term, didn't I? Alter your body. There's lots of ways to do that, would you say? Well, just see a lot of that a while. Number six, the Holy Spirit will give us a sense of, fill in the blank, belonging with the Father. 
I love this, Galatians 4, 6. Because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out Abba. That's an endearing term for father. Abba, father. Father, my very own father is what he's saying. Romans 8, 15. You did not receive the spirit of slavery fall, to fall back into fear, but you've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. That we are the children of God. Listen to this. I spent most of my childhood feeling rejected and neglected. Number of reasons. I don't have time to get into it in the small span of time we have here. But I spent the majority of my childhood going through elementary, middle, and high school feeling less than everybody around me in an attitude of rejection, I seem to assume, carried into my adult life until I met the Lord three weeks before my 18th birthday. And, and suddenly, when I met Jesus, began to get in the Word a sense of belonging. Like we mentioned after praise and worship, we belong to the Father. He loves us. He's endeared to us. All things work together for good with us. So if you, if you, if you have that orphan syndrome, that's, even though I was raised, I have a wonderful mother, a lovely father who's with Jesus. But for me, I almost had this orphan attitude like nobody cares for me. Nobody loves me. I knew my mama loved me, but I thought everybody else didn't give a hoot about me. And then I found out the father loves me. If the father loves me, what you think about me really doesn't matter. If he loves me, that's the end of conversation. If he loves me, if he accepts me, if he's pleased with me, (laughs) hey, how many know then you've got it made? Is that true? I never had a sense of belonging until I I met Jesus. Number seven, the Holy Spirit will give you an overcoming attitude. How many hear me? Instead of seeing the cup half empty, you'll see it half full. Instead of seeing what you can't do, you'll see what you can do. I can do things through Christ who strengthens me. I love 1 John 4, 4, you belong to God, dear children, and have already won a victory over these people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. You go through a hard place and you feel low and you feel like you can't make it, just remind yourself, greater is he. Say it out loud, greater. Say it again, greater. One more time, greater is he who is in me than he who's in the world. So you're going through a hard place. I often remind myself, Father, you and I make majority. We're greater, regardless of what, com- what comes against you and me. Thank God the greater one. He's greater than every problem, greater than every test, greater than any, every trial, greater than the oppositions you face from others. How many know he's just greater? <laughs> one of the dark, darkest times in my life. I, you know, I really wanted to end my life. I was 32 years of age. I really wanted to end my life. And I'll never forget how tender the Holy Spirit was inside me. I really, Susan was working. Our children were young. I was having a really hard time. And I'd started this church, and you've heard that story before. I mean, I'll never forget being in my bedroom. And I'll never forget how gentle yet firm the voice of the Holy Spirit was when he said, get up, get up, get up. In the online notes, I've got in there what he said to me. He told me, get up. It was so forceful. I said, whoa, wait, hang on. He said, get up. Because he saw I was sulking, complaining, going down the wrong track in life, thinking the wrong thing. Get up. And he said, go outside, get your Bible. I just knew intuitively. When the Holy Spirit speaks, we'll talk about how to know when he speaks later on. I went outside. I had 10 oak trees in my backyard. He said, start walking, open your Bible. He took me through the Psalms. He took me through the New Testament and showed me that every problem I faced, that he was able to help me overcome it. And that he had already made a way of escape. I don't have time to tell you today. It's in the online notes. Go get them. I promise. I still go over those scriptures today. When I'm having a hard time, when it looks like all hell's coming against me, I get those scriptures out. I say, Holy Spirit, you reminded me. I'll never forget what you said to me. And it's still true today. Is that good news? So if you're having a hard time, he will help you if you listen. How many hear that? It's awesome. He is awesome because he set his love upon me. Therefore, I will deliver him, God said. I will set him on high because he's known my name. He said that to me. He will call upon me. I'll answer him. I'll be with him in trouble. I'll deliver him and honor him. With long life, I'll satisfy him and show him my salvation. Is that good news? When you feel like you're about to die, that's, man, that's like a cool sip of water. How many hear me? Number eight, the Holy Spirit will urge you to watch your words. 
How many know your words are your life? You'll never live past your words. God can never do more than your words declare. If you're not saying anything, God's not doing anything. If you're saying the wrong things, you're tying his hands. So the Holy Spirit, I can't, I mean, I was, I was astounded 40 and a half years ago when I came to the Lord and I had all these wrong thoughts and wrong words and I start to say these things habitually that I used to say and I just hear, stop. Stop. I'd say what I mean. I, it wasn't two days after I was saved. I was hanging out with a brother. I, fact, I think it was the same night I was filled with the Holy Spirit. I, I was talking to the brothers, a bunch of people around me. And, and I said, well, I can't. And a guy looked at me and said, don't ever say that again. Say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Holy Spirit will urge you to watch your words. If you've got a potty mouth, the Holy Spirit has little to do with you. And potty mouth has not to do just with cursing. It has to do with negative speech. And wrong thinking that is behind negative speech. How many hear that? Let no foul or polluting language, nor evil word, nor unwholesome or worthless talk ever come out of your mouth. But only such speech is as is good and beneficial to the spiritual progress of others as is fitting to the need and the occasion that it might be a blessing and gives grace, God's favor to those who hear it. How many know that's good? Number nine, the Holy Spirit removes, this is good, the desire to sin from the inside. Is that good news? I love this, Romans 8, 13. If you live by it, the flesh is dictates, you'll die. But watch, if through the power of the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature or your body, you will live. You having problems with the flesh? The Holy Spirit can help you overcome the flesh. But we've got to have enough of the Holy Spirit on us to overcome and repel the negative things from our culture. Let me just say this. If you're not spending time, a good bit of time in the Word every day, and a good bit of time praying, and if you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you need to be praying in the Spirit. You've got to have enough of the Holy Spirit on you and in you to repel all that stuff today. I'm telling you, our, our, our culture, just in the past two, two years, has taken a, a terrible dip negative. How many hear me? And you've got to take, this takes the Holy Spirit to keep that off of you. How many know He'll give you a desire to live right and not to live wrong? He'll talk to you strongly. Then lastly, go look at the notes. I've got a lot to say there. Number 10, the Holy Spirit will lead you to live, lead you into unselfish love for others. Now, I'm telling you, that's one of the first things I noticed. Romans 5, 5, hope does not disappoint or put to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. 1 John 3, 14, we know we've passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Listen how strong John is. Whoever does not love, and that's unconditional, self-sacrificial love, God's love, abides in death. You know, let me just say this, before I knew Jesus, I had a public job, and I saw people all day long working in a little grocery store, a little boy, you know. So I, I'm, I'm watching people. And you know what I did? I, I dressed people down. I looked at them. I, I looked for all the flaws. I looked for all the, the things that, that cut them down in my eyes. You know why I did that? I felt so badly about me, I couldn't take the positive in you. So I had to cut everybody down to my level. You find a person that's negative, a person that's constantly sarcastic, that's a person that doesn't feel good about themselves. How many hear that? Huh? That's true. So you find someone that's always talking about the negative, always talking about the flaws in somebody, that's a person that doesn't see themselves the way Jesus sees them. How many know that? I'll never forget sitting in church. I'm dressing down the usher. Oh, look at him. One hair, that hair, his hair ain't right. His part's you know, messed up. Look at his nose. It's, it's messed up. Look at it. One nostril's bigger than the other one. His mouth is crooked. Look at his mouth. Crooked. Look at old crooked mouth on that guy. I, I'm not kidding. It's awful, isn't it? I mean, I looked at one guy that wore ties to church back then. Look at that guy's tie. He don't even know how to tie a Windsor tie. Look at him. He's so stupid. I, I hate to tell you, I did that. Everybody I looked at, I'm looking. I'm looking. Well, let's see. Let me find, what, let's see what can I find wrong with you? Now, how would you, would you like to hang out with somebody like that? But the Holy Spirit came. And I'll never forget. He said, Mitch, what are you doing? I was sitting in church. What are you doing? What are you doing? I said, what do you mean what am I? I was just a habit. You can have mental habits that God has nothing to do with. Huh? I said, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean? Well, you just looked at that guy. 
And you just looked at all of his mess. I said, I did? He said, yeah. I said, I love that guy. You need to love him. And y'all, I'll never forget. I'll never forget. God, God convicted me. No kidding. When I went back to work the next day, I, I'm not kidding. I was, look, people came down my aisle. And you know what? Something happened inside me. And I look at people. And the first thing I thought, God loves that person. The ugly, the purdy, the short. You hear what I'm saying? The tall. The person that's ill-dressed. The person that's half-dressed. He loves them all. And he, he led me to love them. Now, what if you see people with eternity's eyes? It change you. The love of God changed me. And that's the Holy Spirit. Isn't that awesome?